lecture. Tonight we have the honor of being in the presence of someone who has devoted his life to education, something that is key to success in life. It is also fitting that we have this lecture this evening on a date when 50 years ago, an assassin's bullet took the life of one of the most important men in this world, Martin Luther King, a man whom, like Dr. Crew, spent his life the largest and one of the toughest educational systems to run. And so, as we start this evening, let us bear in, let mind, us bear the in mind the sacrifices of people like, of Martin, people like Luther Luther King, Martin Luther King, who've done so much for those who have come behind them, and whose battles continue to be fought by people like Dr. Crew. And so without further ado, I will call on Mr. Wins Winslow Patterson to lead us in the national anthem. And may we all stand. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, it's the chorus of the national anthem. The land of Diana, of rivers and plains, made rich by the sunshine and lush by the rains, said gem like and fair. Between mountains and the sea, your children salute you, dear land of the free. Thank you. And forgive me for not letting, giving you my name. My name is Leyland Lucas. I am the Dean Designate for the School of Entrepreneurship and Business Innovation. I now call on our Vice Chancellor, Professor Ivlaw Griffith, to deliver the opening remarks. Vice Chancellor Griffith. A round of applause for our Chair, Professor Lucas. Good evening. Hmm. Good evening. Let's give it one more try and see what happens. Good evening. Well, then that's a powerful way to begin the program formally. Especially since we've begun a little later than we'd anticipated, I want to not take too much preliminary time in giving my opening remarks. Simply wanted to Acknowledge the presence of our pro-chancellor. Please stand, Major General Retired uh, Joseph Singh. Wanted to give a special welcome to the members of the Executive Council of the United States Caribbean International Education Consortium. And as I'll introduce them, I'll invite them to stand. Dr. Maria de Langoria. <laughs> Ambassador Persu. Professor Clement Imbert, and member of the consortium executive is our keynote speaker. He'll be introduced, but special welcome, Dr. Rudy Crew, president of Medgavis College. Our chairman acknowledged the reality of the day in which we're having this eighth Renaissance lecture. And it's a reality to which I want to refer and refer to it in the context of it was exactly one year to the date, to the date of 
Martin Luther King's Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, where he was giving a speech at Riverdale in New York. And he, in his sermon, used some words which I drew upon as part of my words of wisdom in my values and vision to our university when I arrived here in 2016. And so allow me to share the words that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. shared in Riverdale, New York on April 4, 1967. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with a fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. There is no time for complacency or apathy. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Some of you may be asking, what does this have to do with the topic? But I want to recommend that the fierce urgency of now to which Martin Luther King Jr. was referring, not in a wholly educational context, he was talking about the Vietnam War and the importance of education and advocacy in getting justice. That same urgency, that fierce urgency of now is a fierce urgency of now in the educational sphere. It's a fierce urgency of now for a university like ours that is rebuilding, not only facing and fixing what has been broken, but also looking toward the future to build ahead in preparation for that glorious future that we all would wish. But I'll tell you what you might suspect, and it's a subject to which Dr. Crew will give attention. The fierce urgency of now also requires collaboration beyond nations, beyond institutions. It requires consortia action. And it is a project of our university as we build facing and fixing what has been insufficiencies, as we look towards the future, it is an imperative for us to ask the question, how might we, using collaborations, academic and others, ensure that we are setting the right stage to address the issues of development, of economic and social and personal development, central to which is the educational development. And so I'm delighted especially that we have been able to have, as the speaker for tonight, someone who has dealt with that fierce urgency of now in the educational trenches, not only at the tertiary educational level, but also at the lower levels, what we in Guyana call the primary and secondary stage setting for the tertiary level. I'm delighted that we'll be able to have a conversation led by Dr. Crew of how might we, in the context of addressing the fierce urgency of now in education in the United States, developed country, in Guyana and Caribbean countries, developing countries, how might we use a collaborative connectivity to address those issues. But let me end on the note of acknowledging and thanking Deputy Vice Chancellor Reynolds and her team and all the participants, the collaborators, many of whom are listed at the back of your program. Let's give them a collective round of applause <laughs> by way of saying thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. I now call on Ms. Lysian Blake, who will do a piece titled, Tomorrow Belongs to the People, followed by Ms. Camille Robertson, Deputy Dean, who will do the introduction to Dr. Crew. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, my name is Ms. Lysian Blake. And uh, my poem is actually entitled The New Land by Cyril Canai. Mm. 
in the darkness tonight, I suddenly became aware of the land, as I had never been aware of it before. In the midst of the bundari bush, humble blooms of red flowers sweeten the foul air. The grass is growing greener, and where prickly thorns blossom, creeping pumpkin vines entwine them with their strong roots to feed the starved and clothe the naked of the land. May there yet spring in the light of day from the scorched soil of the heart of man, the torrents of love strangling every strange weed and flooding the new land to make it rich and fertile and free. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, special invitees, pro-chancellor. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce our esteemed speaker. He is the author of Only Connect, The Way to Save Our Schools, which is currently a guide for vital public discussion. He has served on many boards, including the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, Communities in School, and the Al Shankar Institute. He was awarded the NAACP Educational Leadership Award, the Arthur Ashe Leadership Award, and also the 2008 National Superintendent of the Year Award. He is a renowned leader and reformer who has made it his mission to improve student achievement, especially for the poor and minority students. As an educator, he has always worked closely with all stakeholders to expand opportunities for students. He has developed new strategies, including the adoption of curriculum standards for all schools, the creation of new mechanisms for school governance, the introduction of school-based budgeting, and the implementation of processes to screen all students for giftedness include using a range of criteria. He has a master's in business and a doctorate in education. He is the president of the Medgar Edwards College. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rudolph F. Crew. Thank you very much and good evening to all. It's a pleasure to be here, Vice Chancellor, to you, members of your team, your staff. Um, I particularly want to extend my deepest appreciation for the invitation to come here um, to members of the audience, and none of whom I know at this point in time. Uh, but I hope uh, we do have an opportunity following this to exchange pleasantries uh, before the evening is out. Um, I, I looked at the topic of the evening and thought at one point in time that I would uh, spend a fair amount of my conversation looking at the question of tertiary education through the lens really of education itself. Having spent many years running school systems across the nation, um, it would make sense to do that. Uh, and then I began to think about what I really feel about this, and particularly listening uh, uh, to Dr. Griffith and thought, you know what, I want to I personalize this a little bit. Um, I want you to know a little bit about me and why some of the ideas that I have are on the table now, both through our own consortium uh, that was alluded to momentarily, um, as well as some of the work that we're doing at Mega Revis College, and what I think we have to do globally um, to be able to really right this ship. And there is no way to approach this um, that is soft in nature. Uh, now is the time for us to have, if we've got it left in us at all, 
a fierce urgency of now. He's exactly right about that. And Dr. King was exactly right about it uh, 50 years ago. So my comments begin with me telling you a little bit about my beginning. Um, I, I'm originally from New York. My father was from Georgia. My mother was from the South. And I ended up going to school listening to a man who had no, no formal education himself. My mother died when I was two. And my father said to me when I was about five or six years old, boy, you have to get your education. I don't care what else happens in this world. You have to get your education. And as I got older and older and started going to different schools, I remember him coming into my high school the very first year that I was there as a freshman. And he asked me, Rudy, what courses do you think you should take? And I said, I want to take the easiest courses that will get me in here and out of here as quickly as I can, Pop. And he looked at me and he said, son, he said, now, I thought I told you that your job is to go to college. And nothing I understand about college begins with the word easy. So you have to actually say again, I'm going to ask you this question again, I want to ask you, what is it that you want to take here? I said, well, I want to take the lowest level mathematics course, Pop. Don't put me anything really hard. He said, Rudy, in about an hour, we're going to meet with a guidance counselor, and they're going to sign you up for courses. I didn't have the benefit of going to school, but I can tell you that what you just said is not what you're going to tell this guidance counselor. I said, well, then, Pop, you have the conversation with the guidance counselor. I'm because if I have to talk with her, this is exactly what I'm going to tell her. Let me have shop, PE, matter of fact, a double period of PE. Let me have low level English. He said, what about a foreign language? I said, no, 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 I'm not going to take a foreign language. If you want me to, I'll take two courses in English. So the woman came in, I'll never forget her name, her name was Miss Garibaldi. Miss Garibaldi came into the room and I stood up to meet her and my father said to me very quickly, he will have nothing to say. I'll speak for him. And it hit me at that moment, he doesn't know what to say about education. He won't know what courses to even tell her. And so I sat and I listened dutiful son that I was. And he said to this woman something I'll never forget. He said, I want my son to take the same level of courses that it takes to get into Harvard University. And I looked at him as though he had lost his complete mind. He said, I don't know because I didn't go to school. I finished the fourth grade, so I don't know what the name of those courses are. But I want him to take the courses in English, in math, in science, that it will allow him to go to the highest university in the United States. He said, now, if you put him in those classes, I guarantee you he'll, he'll survive. He'll do well. And by now, I'm, I've got sweat beads coming off my forehead. And so the woman began to open a book and look at my transcript. And she said, oh, Mr. Crew, I'm afraid your son won't qualify for the highest level English class that we have as a freshman. And he won't qualify for the math class. I'm so sorry, Mr. Crew. Your son really is going to have to take summer school just from what I'm seeing already from his record. And my father said very quickly, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. He is not going to be in summer school. And yes, ma'am, he is going to take these higher courses because I don't know who you are, but I know you have a boss. And if your boss has to come in here to sign him up, then let's do that. And I listened to a man define for me the landscape of what it meant to demand higher education for a child. I didn't understand it at the time. And I surely did not like it. 
But I, I remember him saying out loud and with great force, there will be no choice in his ability to go out into the world and prosper. That is not even an option here. This is a fait accompli. And with that, I began my high school career, went off to college, etc. And why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because I went to a business school many years back and thought for a long time about this conversation in terms of going out into the world, what it meant. And going out into the world really meant how do you go out and make a living? What skills will you proffer in the world that will allow you to participate in the world as a gainful, employed person who can pay for his or her own way, who will ultimately be able to do the things that are the requisite of a democracy. How will I go forward and do that? And I remembered thinking to myself, wow, in order to be able to do that, the schooling that I get then now has to be completely different. It has to change completely by comparison to the then world and the now world. And so I want to start my comments with you tonight by talking about what I think the trends are, both economically and to some degree educationally, but certainly economically, I want to frame this discussion around trends that are happening in the world that you see and I see every day you turn on your television or walk out into the street. And that first trend has to do with the way by which race and gender and ethnicity are playing a hand in shaping the domain in the world. It is Martin's work. It is his work. It is, it is the quintessential element of who are we as a global people? And what have we done to one another that would allow us to have lived lives of desperation on the one hand, aspiration on the other, and have tremendous numbers of people caught in between those two worlds, only to be leveled or pr provide a leveling playing field by virtue of being in an educational institution. And this discrepancy between what I think of as upside life and downside life, poverty versus affluence, this discrepancy is getting wider and wider and wider. We live now both socioeconomically as well as racially and ethnically, we live in greater and greater and greater splits and schisms than we have ever done in our history since slavery. We have literally created a tale of two cities, if not more. And the question for us in terms of education is can that be the way this goes forward? In terms of the economy, it is the question of whether or not that meets the need of a country and the growth of that nation. Will that system withstand the pressure of time to actually change so that more people have access to the goods and services and the resources that they richly deserve. So that's one of the very first big 21st century trends of our day. It has a huge impact on tertiary education, and I'll speak to that in a moment. A second trend is the need for us to understand and pay attention to security and stabilization as well as conflict avoidance. Now this business of security and stabilization is probably in everyone's mind in the form of technology, in the form of who can have access to your data and information. Who would have thought that in 1950 or 60 or 70 that we would now be talking about people having access unless you granted them access to your bank account? Who would have thought that they would have at their beck and call the availability to get anything that they want on you or on your children in the way of information and sell you things from Amazon, something called Amazon, that you can get in 24 hours and have delivered to your home. It has been on the one hand an incredibly uh, rich and resourceful uh, part of the economy. On the other hand, it's been the devil of our lives in the sense that we now have people who can exploit and go into your life because of this question of security and stabilization. A third trend is this issue of migration and displacement. In New York City, we think about this as gentrification. All over the, all over the world, we're looking at, at countries 
that are trying to figure out who should live in the wonderful areas and who should not. Who should have access to good housing and who should not. Who should, have be, who should be living in public housing and who should not. And it's all a function, in many cases, of the distribution of goods and, 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 and resources, the, a function of the, the distribution of money, who has access to the kind of resources to be able to buy a home in the area that they would like and not. But that's part of a trend that is global. It is not necessarily just Detroit or New York City or here um, in Guyana. It's all over the world. People are being displaced because, in fact, land is, in, is, a still, is still a rich and very highly prized commodity, and those who have access to it will be landowners. Those who do not will be living in some way, shape, or form in a public setting, uh, depending upon how the government meets that out. The last trend that I think is important and has implications for tertiary education is the issue of industrialization and technology. Now, Thomas Friedman wrote a book some years back about this notion of the world being flat. And I was intrigued by that and read the book uh, quite a bit and spent a fair amount of time lecturing uh, about it all around the country. But one of the things that I was doing was I was at the time running a company in Dubai. And in Dubai, I spent year after year looking at their education system juxtaposed to the availability of jobs that were coming into the country largely connected to oil and refineries. And I remembered asking myself, my, my goodness, will this ever stop? Will there ever be a time when the oil runs out? And if so, what will the country then do? And I asked a colleague that same question, and he said, what we will do is we will have the greatest export in our world, which will be human beings. We will turn to human beings, and we'll no longer have oil, but we'll have bright people who know how to mine and find oil, or know how to use uh, STEM research as a way of being able to find the next job, or create the next job, or become entrepreneurs in the next world. But we will never, ever, ever be without the ability to have a high GDP, because we have two things. We have natural resources, and we have human capital. Made total sense, but it put on the table that this major trend in the world is about industrialization, the need for the world to understand industrial markets and to trade in those industrial markets, and technology, and the ways by which technology are going to be, will be used as, as a means by which to harness new and different uh, jobs. Now, I say those trends only because the, the, the issue of globalization has, has changed um, the way we think about a whole host of industries. It's changed the telecommunications industry, it's changed the medical industry, it's changed the education industry. And we've got to pay attention to what that ultimately means. means number one, uh, it means that the competitive playing field is now completely different than it ever was before. Now, some would argue, you know, we've always w lived by the world uh, view that if you had an education, you were able gonna, you were going to be able to, to, to make it in society. The problem is that simply having an education, being functionally literate, is insufficient for a 21st century global economy. The standards at which we are talking about educating young people whether they be in elementary and secondary schools or in tertiary schools, the standards ultimately have to be much, much, much higher. And they have to have far more reaching domains of learning than just as we think about academic learning. So don't hear anything I'm about to say as being anti-school or anti-particular uh, disciplines, but hear it in the context of it's too narrow a road. Just simply thinking about a person having a high, school degree, a high school diploma or a college diploma is too narrow a road. It is insufficient. We've been all hepped up on the idea of tertiary education give, granting, granting someone a degree. That's fine. That's good. I'm glad for that. But now we live in an era in which the industrialized world wants you to have something that may be more akin to a certification not necessarily just a degree. And that maybe there has to be some learning that was pre-learned 
before you even got your degree. We'll call that, for lack of a better word, an internship. A student said to me not too long ago, this time I was uh, chancellor in New York City, and he said to me, he said, Chancellor, I ran into him in a store. He said, Chancellor, um, I really, really, really like that suit you're wearing. I said, son, someday you'll be able to get that suit yourself. He said, I said, you're going to walk out here, you're going to find yourself a great job, and you're going to be able to buy 20 of these suits. And he said, well, in order for me to get that suit, i got to have the kind of job you have. I said, well, that might be true. He said, well, can you get me a hookup? Can you give me a hookup? Can you get me that job? I said, son, you're 16 years old. You're not ready to be chancellor yet. But I can tell you the hookup you need is exactly right. You need, my words, not his, you need a leg up. You need a way of being able to get to the work you think you want to do with passion in your life. And that leg up is what I'm describing now as the way by which tertiary education has got to change. We've got to actually understand that it's not enough to simply accumulate credits or even accumulate degrees. It is about giving students connection to the next iteration of their life as a part of their formal training. It is not exclusive of, it's in tandem with. It's not an add-on for some whose parents demand it. It's a requirement for all because that is how the economic world now is requiring people to demonstrate their capacity for wage earning or high wage earning jobs. Let me talk for a second about what I think those skills are. One of those skills is, and I'm going to describe these in terms of of adequacies. I I think of them as domains, but but I want to talk about them as as being adequate in this area. So I I mentioned the, the notion of having academic adequacy. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that whether you are in third grade or 13th grade, you are going to have to be functionally literate in one and possibly two languages And you are going to be able to need, you're going to need to be able to do mathematics at a 21st century level, and you're going to need to understand how to be a critical thinker. If I could just winnow it down to these three things, I would say you've got to have young people who in the third grade are carrying forward for every grade that they spend in school. They are growing by one year, every single year that they spend in school. They are growing in their ability to read, to write and do mathematical computation. They are growing not by a test demonstrating that they're growing. They're growing by virtue of their application of these skills in the context of the curriculum that they have in front of them. It's not just knowing the, having the knowledge, it's applying the knowledge. Now, if I were talking to an audience of people in secondary schools, I'd be talking about how curriculum has got to change so that young people actually are applying their knowledge, not necessarily just knowing it. But it's really important that you understand and think about the hours that you may spend if you were a professor or formerly a professor, or the hours that you now spend as a parent having your young son, daughter, granddaughter, whomever, having that young person actually in applied learning circumstances versus cognitive learning circumstances where they are just simply taking in information. There's nothing wrong with the former. It's that the world demands the latter. When you graduate from a high school, one is going to expect you to apply the rules of good grammar. They're going to expect you to apply the rules of mathematics. They don't want to go back and reteach those things. All too often, our schools are now having to be places of reteaching skill sets that we actually should have had them acquire much earlier in their elementary or secondary schools. So academic adequacy is one of these very high-level requirements of the new world. Math, reading, cognitive, I mean, uh, critical thinking. A second one, though, that's equally as important in my book is this notion of workplace literacy or adequacy. It's the idea that you have to know how to work. You have to know how to find a job. You have to know how to understand your own passion. You have to know how to explain that passion to someone else. 
You have to actually understand that there are other people who will see you and understand the concept of work as simply meaning the value that you're able to produce economically, when for you, for the artist, for example, the value is in the production of the work itself. And you've got to actually, somewhere in your elementary, high school, and tertiary educational experience, you've got to find a way where young people are experiencing their passion in the workplace. Now, a way of being able to do that is internships. Uh, that's one structure. But there are many more. And colleges and universities are all over this issue as it relates to international education, as it relates to uh, providing opportunities for, as the student said, getting students a leg up earlier before they graduate so they are actually in the dentist office or they're working in a medical field or they're working in an oil uh, refinery center or they're doing something that allows them to actually discover for themselves what it is that they feel, if you will, occupationally prepared to spend their life doing. Third area, personal adequacy. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been following rather quick, rather uh, uh, intensely these questions about who is shooting whom in the world. Where are young people dying before the age of 21? Where are young people being co-opted by wartime kinds of activities and uh, uh, journal, journalistic kinds of enterprises that have them going in one direction or the other? I'm not here to proselytize or suggest that there's a, a best answer about where someone wants to spend their political life, but I am saying that we have a high suicide rate we have a high number of young, particularly children of color, who are dying in jails and who are unfortunately cast into a world in which the end game of their schooling was that they either are locked out of schools or they're locked up in jails. And all too often, we see that that phenomenon is a function of people having had no sense of their personal adequacy. They made decisions that were bad or they were put in environments in which their personal decision making was flawed, or it was guided by a, a warped moral sense of assumptions. Now, I honestly believe that this personal adequacy is as important as academic adequacy. I happen to believe that a young man or a young woman who knows how to say hello or look you in the eye and say good evening or talk with you or exchange their ideas, even if you don't agree with them and can hold their own or who can occupy a, a, a place on the stage with the vice chancellor or anybody else who can come and recite a poem, anybody who's able to do that is a young man or a young woman who is not subject to the ideas of being ripped off in their own human heart. That they don't surrender in the face of failure. That they don't give up. That they have resilience. That they understand that an F in a class is not an F for your personhood. So I look at this and think, what are the experiences in schooling, in tertiary education, where young people will learn resilience? Where will they get the ability to understand how to use that resilience if, in fact, they don't get the job that they wanted to? If they interviewed and it didn't go so well? Or if they tried something and it didn't work out? Or if they wound, found up, wound up wanting to be with someone that didn't want to be with them? That's not a reason to end your life. That's a reason to start a new life. Lord knows I, I, I know a little bit about that. So I'm, I'm saying to you that our young people are trying to figure out somewhere along the lines of how they will learn these skill sets and what experiences does tertiary education give a person that would enable them to actually have access to these sensibilities, these are personal sensibilities, the ability to make a friend, the ability to talk to someone whose faith or whose belief in God is different from yours, the ability to talk with someone whose first language is not your language, the ability to make a friend out of someone who historically has been, if you will, the opposite end of your political spectrum. All of this is what a new world needs. It is not about living in silos, it's about decreasing these silos, building bridges, and literally allowing people culturally to exchange their, their, their intelligence and their genius in ways that allow them to make peace as well. Last and certainly not least, 
there is this notion of civic literacy. The ability for young people to understand that they are part of a community and that that community has certain things that they require. You must, for example, give to the community. You are not an island unto yourself. You must actually learn how to give way before you learn how to get. You must actually be able to explain how you will improve the community. These are skills that young people have to acquire along the way in, in tertiary education. Therefore, the tertiary education that I view as needing to be the machine, if you will, for that looks slightly different from what we have right now. The, the machinery we have right now, and I use it term loosely, but the machinery we have right now functions very much on the basis of supply. When we open the doors, here they come. In the states, we have compulsory attendance laws. We have people who want to come to college. Uh, we give people incentives by virtue of offering uh, scholarships, et cetera. But the idea of tertiary education in developing nations is no longer an option. It is not about supply. It is mostly about demand. And so the question I would pose for all of you who are educators is what do you now offer in a competitive market in your own educational institutions, which if the students were to say, I demand you have this in my school, what is it that you would offer in response? You don't live in a supply side environment anymore. The supply side got completely taken away by virtue of technology being able to offer education anytime, anywhere. So now everybody can offer something that's akin to what you offer. You now have to literally think, well then what would make someone choose me? Why would someone come to my college? Why would someone sign up to my course? Why would someone view the things that I'm doing as being useful to their lives? Education, in order to be a 21st century, globally ready and more nimble environment, has to be both, and I'm going to do this in dual things, it both has to be individualized, but it's also got to be collective. We have to be able to talk to the masses who want to come into our schools, but we also have to talk to that individual. We've got to find a way of being able to create schools and universities and settings in which the individual needs that a person has, whether it be personal need or academic need, but those individual needs actually are heard and listened to and responded to by virtue of the institution itself. It's not enough to say, come to my class, be here, be square. It's not enough to say, if you're able to be here, then be here. If not, and you miss the course, then by God, you're just out of the class. I'm not talking about removing or diminishing standards. I'm talking about having something, which I'll, I'll close on in a minute, but I'm, I'm talking about having the good sense to understand that your environment just got changed by Google. Your environment just got changed when Amazon made it possible to avoid going to the Piggly Wiggly or whatever y'all call your store down here to the, to the supermarket. You don't have to go there to get everything you want. You can have it delivered to your home because Amazon will deliver it to you for whatever they pay, whatever you have to pay in a fee. So your education system has to be individualized because the world now is able to customize everything from banking to schooling. Second thing that tertiary education is going to have to do is be far more predictable and yet flexible. Predictable in the sense that what we offer and the way by which we position ourselves as offering value to people who are paying customers, that they have to be able to get that value. They have to be able to see that value. If we're going to offer internships, you better have the internship. 
If you're going to have a class, you can't cancel the class at the last minute and tell everybody to go home. If you're going to be able to get the grades in, you got to get the grades in on time. Now, I'm not speaking to anybody here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying, to, I'm trying to get out tomorrow on my airplane and not have made any enemies. But I am saying the truth about what makes us predictable as an industry. When people pay their money, they want to be able to know that when school starts, there will be a professor that I will see every day. And that's going to be the professor I have for science or chemistry or, or whatever it may be. They want to know that the structure of the college will be there for them and support their acquisition. Hey. That's predictability for you. Yeah, I'm trying to be flexible with it. There you go. You then turn this into a little party. So, so, the, so the idea of having a, an institution that is predictable goes to the heart of value that people want to pay for. Amazon is able to be Amazon not because they are a gazillion dollar company, but because if you order it on Monday and they tell you it's going to be there by Wednesday, it's there. Whether we want it like that or not, that is something we have come to know and understand as a part of the economy we need to believe in. And yet flexible enough that if it's going to change, if we need to make an arrangement that's different, we actually know how to have a conversation with you individually versus you. We're going to have a conversation to say, I'm sorry, this product is now out of stock and we're going to have to now get it to you in a month. So we've got to be able to live on the horns of both of those cir circumstances. Tertiary education is going to have to be innovative and yet at the same time standardized. So let me, let me, let me walk through that. Innovative in the sense that it has got to be able to be responsive to the global trends that I talked about before. It cannot be stuck in the this is how we did it last year modality. Now, I, the academy is an interesting place because while we appreciate academic freedom, we have in many cases interpreted that to be the bedrock of do it the way we did it last year. Whether it works for the world, whether it works for the economy, whether it works for the students, whether or not it is actually something that will allow us to be more competitive in the marketplace where more students have more choices or not, we simply sometimes get ourselves wrapped around this axle of sameness. We've got to avoid that. But in the case of innovation, we've got to be willing to allow people to become intellectual artists. Our professoriate is a place of artistry. The day-to-day -day work that they provide, regardless of discipline, is a canvas upon which they get to paint their artwork around their discipline, their readings, their knowledge, their skill set, their genius is what you actually are putting forward as the one most important asset you have in your college and university. But yet on the other hand, we've got to be able to say when there are only two people or three people who've signed up for a course, and that's happened three, four, five semesters in a row, we've got to be able to change what that course is about because the market is talking to you. The market is literally saying, this is not for us. This is not for us either in content or in presentation. But something is not working here. So we've got to have enough nimbleness of heart to be able to say, without being dogmatic and, and, and sort of schizophrenic, but we have to be able to say we need to actually redo this entire body of work. And last and certainly not least, the, the tertiary education model, in my mind, would have to uh, become much more competitive and at the same time much more collaborative. Competitive in the sense that you have to realize there are too many other people who can eat your lunch. There are many more institutions who are available, whether you like their quality or not, whether you accept them as viable or not, they exist, and they exist on a world market stage, and they are after your students the same way as they're after my students. 
It means that we have to accept that we are a part of an economy, a world economy, where competition is very much in play. The work of uh, Friedman talks about this, uh, and, and, and I, I, I quoted him here. He, he, competitive playing field has been uh, uh, industrialized, and the emerging market and the industrialized market are now being leveled because large companies, small companies, individuals, and entrepreneurs are becoming part of a global network of offerings. That's exactly right. An individual parent can say, I'm going to be homeschooling my child. That makes that a school. An individual school may say, I want to only offer school Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but we're going to have longer days and a longer year. That's their prerogative to do, as long as they meet whatever the codes are and laws are for being able to do that. And a college may make some of the same adaptations, but they've got to understand that they are going to have to do it with an eye toward both competitiveness and collaboration. The collaboration part works this way. I would argue that there are many, many companies uh, within uh, uh, Guyana and, and within the Caribbean where we actually don't leverage everything out of those companies that we could get from an educational standpoint, even though arguably we think we're getting what we can get, them, get from them from an economic standpoint. So I would be saying to Google or to Amazon or to uh, YouTube or any of these other high tech uh, or mobile oil or uh, Amoco or whomever, I would be saying to them, if you are going to be in my zone, my school zone, here are things that I want from you above and beyond the jobs that people will have, above and beyond the industry uh, footprint that you'll provide here. But I need jobs for my, my students uh, to be able to have internships. I need jobs for students during the summer. I need jobs for uh, parents who are literally trying to transition in their own lives and go back to school. There will be multiple things that I would be asking for from these corporate uh, conglomerates and giants because they have the ability to collaborate with us and offer things that we could never on our own be able to buy. Our state money, our local money in and of itself is small enough that we can't do it alone. Even if we have the dream and the, the, the audacity to hope for it, we can't put it together and be able to buy it on our own and we need to have collaborators. In closing, let me just say a word about leadership. You know, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in various educational institutions all over the country and now the world. And I am convinced that the leaders we have now, ha the, one, the ones that are exceptional in being able to literally create the kind of uh, educational environment and the mix uh, that I'm describing here this evening, uh, that the leadership basically looks a little bit like this. And I would include uh, Dr. Griffith and others here that I've met over, over a course of time in this. One is they've got to be em empathetic. They've got to have a heart. You've got to be able to see and know. Tell me your name, son. Leon? Cleon. You've got to be able to know Cleon. He can't be a number on your, on your campus dial. You've got to be able to know a little bit about him and be able to talk to him and look him in the eye and see when he's having a good day and a bad day. I don't care how big or small the campus is, there's got to be a sense of empathy that brings leaders into this body of work in a very different way than we've ever had before. And I would argue the same is true for their relationships with faculty. The quintessential element of higher education in the world, and certainly at my college, is the relationship that students have with a professor. That's where you make your money. That's where their pay dirt is, if you will. And yet, if we don't pay attention to that because we are playing some sort of a, a different sort of highbrow game, then you end up basically turning him off, her off, and they then go to the uh, array of other options that they have available to them. So leaders have to be empathic. Secondly, the leadership that I expect to see in this next period of time will be both strategic in nature, they'll have to understand how to think about this in longer terms, but nimble at the same time. How do you actually make changes mid-course, 
correct as we go along, get better as we go along. Don't get afraid of the competition. Don't be afraid to actually think of tertiary education as being something that can break. It's not going to break. It only will actually become more brittle by virtue of the lack of nimbleness. And third, leadership is going to have to demand more than think about supply. You're going to have to literally begin to think about what is it that would make me a standout in a field of academic institutions where everybody's got choices. Why would somebody choose to come to my place? That's demand side thinking, not supply side thinking. Yes, we'd like to wait for more budget, but better budget days. Yes, we'd like to wait for more and more money to come by way of uh, global dollars coming into our country or coming into our cities. Yes, we'd like to wait for the mayor to give us more and on and on and on. But it reminds me a little bit of birds that are waiting in a nest for someone else to feed them. And as they wait, the hope is that, my goodness, maybe there is no one coming to feed us. No, this is really, as I think Barack Obama said, we are the change we've been waiting for. He was exactly right. We are the ones who will save us. And we've got to be able to think and, and act uh, uh, in that way. Last and certainly not least, um, I mentioned this notion of having to be collaborative. Leaders that I expect to see emerging as college presidents, emerging as superintendents of schools, deans, vice chancellors, chancellors, these are people who actually know the benefit of collaboration, who do not see that the work that they are doing is, some, is, is a silo unto themselves. They know how to distribute good leadership. They know how to distribute ideas. They know how to turn over those ideas to faculty in ways that will allow them to grow them, better them, improve upon them, take that idea, chisel it more and more and more, and make it better and better and better. I want to say one last thing about this. This is a, this is a, a time in the history of the U.S. where we've, I, I've never seen, I've never seen such dysfunction around the industry um, of education. <clears throat> and every time I have seen dysfunction in an organization, I have never looked at the workers in that organization. I've always looked at the head of the organization. I'm not here to characterize the person in the White House in any particular way, but trust me when I tell you, it'll be a good day, it'll be a good day when we are not besieged by this back and forth, frick and frack motion around issues that are so important to the global world and so important to education as a whole. Uh, I've listened to and been courted to talk, talk with Betsy DeVos, and I find that we are in deep trouble when it comes to being able to understand how to distribute resources in ways that would improve the lot of people in Guyana or the people in Newark, New Jersey, or the people in Brooklyn, New York. We are very disadvantaged in this way. And that does not give us reason for despair. It gives us reason to ultimately build a stronger, more resilient self and model for our young people what does it look like to really tackle 21st century global problems as a part of our secondary or post-secondary educational institutions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, President Crew. Uh, you've given us a whole lot to think about, but rather than stand here and tell people what you've got us to think about, I would like to open the floor for a question and a session. So we will start wherever and we will move around the room. Good evening. I guess from from previous times you, we need to introduce ourselves. All right? So I'm Patrick Etwaru from the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Natural Sciences. Um, I'm one of the lecturers there. 
Um, the whole issue of education is something very, um, I'm very passionate about. I've been doing work with our Ministry of Education, working with secondary and to a certain extent primary school. Um, because that's our feed and also it's where we develop our people. We actually, we actually in my opinion, um, destroy our, our future leaders, our scientists, and so dear with our approach towards how we treat them. And uh, a statement that I've been saying, in, to a certain extent, privately to colleagues, which I'm going to say publicly now, is that um, in our region, CARICOM, right, the education system for the secondary um, level education was controlled by a body called um, the Caribbean Examination Council, called CXC, and they do two sets of exams. My statement is that CXC is on the developing the Caribbean. And um, I will go now to say why. What we found is that, and teaching in the first, first year at university here, what I found is that over the years, there's a diminishing in ability of the students that come in. And it's not that they come in with poor grades. They come in with good grades, and they feel they have achieved so much and when you throw the challenge to them, especially issues like critical thinking, even basic cognitive things you would have expected them to know, that we would have known, right, at, at that age group, right, at the age level, they no longer know. So I'm saying, if we don't, as a Caribbean community, address that issue with CXC, right, and what they're doing with the, um, the whole education system within the secondary schools especially, we are going to continuously keep getting worse and worse as a community. So we need to challenge that. I say the number of people here within this room who know who has the influence, we need to start looking seriously at that if we want to develop our Caribbean. Thank you. Uh, a fascinating lecture. Um, I would like to suggest that it was very well constructed in that um, there was an introduction, there was a main body, and then there was a sort of a, a closing off of it. But to me, the main part of your lecture was talking about the skill set that is really needed, that is going to be needed for the present world. And um, I would like to say two things that seem to be on opposite ends of a spectrum. One is that the actual demand for work, particularly in Guyana, does not correspond to what people are learning. Right now, I could tell you that you could probably work as a laborer in the rice fields and make more money than many people who are working in offices. In other words, there is a demand out there for something that is not catered to by the education system. But these very persons who are working at that level, they have a serious flaw based on the other aspects of the skill set that you spoke about, the personal, um, the personal skills. For example, they're the type of people who will tell you they come out to work on Monday and you don't see them, that sort of thing. I think you would fully well understand what I'm talking about. And in fact, as a little aside, I like to say it, and I hope I, I have the opportunity to say it at other fora, but one of the best bargains you could probably get in terms of staff in Guyana is a graduate of the university or the Guyana School of Agriculture, because you're getting people who have a level of academic achievement, who know what is hard work, and who have learned those skills that you speak about here. But what I'd like to say is I think that one of the things that's missing in our education system is something that has been missing for probably about a thousand years. And that is the old classical form of education. I feel that I'd like to suggest to you and maybe what do you think? We should be looking at philosophy to teach us how to live a life. We should be looking at logic to teach us how we think and to see those flaws in thinking. And we should learn rhetoric. 
which is basically the, the art of persuasion, both to allow us to get our point across and for us to recognize when we're being played. So, Doc, I'd like to know if you have any comments on those aspects. Thank you, Thank you very much. Tell me your name. Martin. Um, your comments were profound. I appreciate them. Um, I actually agree with you uh, in terms of the classical education. The problem is that we can't replace one best system for another best system. So you can't take what we think of today as a comprehensive education and then say, oh, no, we're going to scratch that and we're now going to now in create a more classical education or go back to a more classical education. I think it's a both and, not an either or. I think we've got to be willing to create a platform that's wide enough, wide enough that it can contain what we think of as comprehensive education, classical education, a two-year education, right? There ought to be students who can challenge what they know or challenge the exams or challenge their, their content and be finished in two years as opposed to taking all four. And I think we've also got to have a larger conversation about the idea of vocational education as it applies to things like agriculture and a whole host of other kinds of settings in which student preparation for that is not devoid of academic richness, but it's in addition to. And the idea of having these multiple strands in what we think of as secondary education would then lead to better choices in tertiary education. So if they spent more time knowing in middle school or in high school what they're really good at doing, what they really like to do, they wouldn't come to college and circle the airplane trying to figure out what is life or where do I think I want to go or what things do I think I want to try to do. So I, I agree with you, but I think you're going to literally have to start doing more around um, expanding the platform by which we offer those things so it's not either or. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next round of questions. We'll have three questions and then Dr. Crew will respond, starting with Justice Singh. Thank you. I'm Justice Carl Singh. I'm the head of the Department of Law. Looking at your theme for tonight, sir, it speaks first of bridging the divide between developed and developing countries. And so I believe what inheres in the theme in the descriptive labels of our respective regions may amount to the haves and the have-nots. And so I, I wanted to ask you whether you would agree that usually what creates the apparent divide is founded on the availability of resources. And secondly, if you do agree that it is the issue of resources that creates this schism between developed and developing countries, whether making resources available, whether collaborating on the question of resources would be one sure way by which we can bridge that divide. That's very helpful, very helpful. Um, I, I, I think I'm not, I'm not inclined to agree completely with your first premise. I, I, I don't think that the have and have not world is a derivative of solely access to resources. I think that's a consequence of the have and have not phenomenon, but I, I, but I don't think it's a derivative of that. I think, I think we, are, we are split. We are economically and, if you will, ethnically split. Um, by virtue of who has, who has uh, intellectual and or physical resources that the world wants or knows it wants, and thus many, many people 
are sort of uh, living in a world in which they are So I would use as an example uh, the copper mines in, 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 uh, in Chile many years ago uh, when people were trying to nationalize uh, the copper industry. Or I would use the gold mines in Africa. The, the people who do not have access to the value of that gold are the local Africans who actually mine the gold. The people who actually have resources are the people who brought the hardware to come in and do the mining. And so I think that there has been a sense of um, global imperialism. I think there's been a sense of um, purposeful uh, destruction of other cultures and other people, all in service of getting the resources that they need in order to be more powerful, if you will. So. Uh, today's trade wars, as an example, are, are simply a way of being able to say, I'm going to take two of your knights and, you know, you're going to take my queen uh, and, a, and, a, and a rook and, you know, we'll call it even. Well, that's fine between China and the United States if that's all that happens. But really what's going to happen is the soybean farmer someplace in Iowa is the person who's going to catch hell. The person someplace else is going to be able to be downstream. That's the person who will die. On the, the second point that you were raising um, is whether or not there's, there's uh, a way of being able to bridge that gap differently. Um, I think the answer is yes, but I think we own the future to being able to do that, and we have not stepped up to the plate. I don't think educators writ large have stepped up to this particular potential of being able to use education as that great intervener, that great convener of new possibilities that it could be. We've given all of that away. We've allowed, and this gentleman talked about it a moment ago, we've allowed elementary and secondary education to almost become useless from the standpoint of skill development. We've now given that, handed that off to someone else to do. It's becoming more privatized in the United States as an example, and as a result of that, we're literally giving away our greatest asset as educators, which is the ability to change the human mind and ultimately the, the human heart. Your quest for philosophy as a course or logic as a course backs up even further what you are as an attorney or in the law school is exactly right. You've got to have people who actually don't, who don't necessarily disbelieve in the law or who call it fake. You've got to have people who actually have a heart to be able to implement the law and yet know how to change the law at the same time. Thank you. A question in the front row. Please identify yourself. A very good evening to everyone. My name is Timothy Cullen Cornelius Rutherford. I am a PhD student, University of Vienna, within the Faculty of Natural Sciences, Department of Biology. I would like to also acknowledge the presence of Dr. Rudolf Crew and our Vice Chancellor, uh, Ivo Law Griffith, as well as Pro Chancellor Joe Singh. Dr. Rudolf F. Crew, in your presentation, you mentioned that academic education in the 21st century for decision making in the context of tomorrow is today demands security and stabilization. Please allow me to also mention that not very long ago in 2015, September, His Excellency David Granger, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, in his presentation to the General Assembly of the United Nations, implored on the international community to meet the requirements of security financing, including calculating the cost of such financing. The academic adequacy is indeed imperative for economic, environmental, and social development, with the standard setting and security standard showing a calculus whereby the United States of America negotiated with South Korea in the trade deficit for military hardware, which is indeed one, whereby South Korea would contribute 80 trillion United States dollars and the United States of America, 80 trillion United States dollars towards um, a total of 160, and of course their contribution for another 80 
towards the $200 trillion to meet the demands of the developing world for a total of $360 trillion United States dollars. Uh, my question, Dr. Rudolph Crew, um, in today's context of distribution of resources and from our presentation this evening, how would you regard the United States' contribution towards our national security means taken into consideration? Um, our security factor is perhaps one of the best in the region, and um, the United States of America contributes um, less than that of China. I take very seriously your previous statement as pertaining to um, United States of America and China as it pertains to security. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, if I understand your question, you're asking me about how do I think about China in the United versus the United States in the context of security? I just want to make sure I'm, hear I'm hearing your question correctly. Thank you very much, Dr. Rudolph Crew. I wish to draw to your attention the trade-related investment mechanism as a negotiating uh, forum between the United States of America and South Korea, whereby the standard setting, the financing for stabilization it. was Got actually derived. Okay. And I wanted to bring to the question, um, would the United States of America consider its contribution to Guyana, um, particularly nationally, as adequate within the, the, the very given context? Right. So I, I, first of all, I can't speak, I'm, I'm not a diplomat, so I can't speak on behalf of the United States. Um, but I, 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 I can tell you my opinion. My opinion is that the United States right now um, is not in a position, not in a very strong position, to advocate for uh, a trade deficit change that in any way moves money into developing nations, not because it's not the right thing to do, but because we don't have the leadership to basically think that whole thing through as a function of the tool of, 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 of trade deficits. So when I listen to uh, uh, the, the person who's in the White House now, I do not hear a, a real understanding of how trade deficits affect the global markets. I hear someone playing tit for tat. I'm going to get them back because they took $12 from me, and I'm now going to take $20 from them. And they don't understand the complexity of trade deficits or how the tool and the mechanism of trade deficits could be used to create great leveling of the world economy in developing nations. It could very well be that we could see, if we chose to, it's doubtful that this person will, but if we chose to, you could actually create an opportunity where trade deficits with China or with anyone else would allow for or could become a, a negotiating tool for leveraging other resources to be spent in countries like Guyana um, or in Africa or in South America, Latin America. You could find that there would be people who would do that in actual desire with a desire to actually elevate the GDP of other nations. That's just simply more global altruism than I see coming out of the White House right now. I don't see anybody being willing to entertain that. I don't see anybody even understanding it. The unfortunate part about it is that when you look at what is happening in terms of the trade deficit between the, this country and China, what you are finding is that that deficit is actually going to quadruple over time. It is going to get nothing but larger, and the larger it gets, the more people in the United States it will hurt and the less political will there will be to share any other, any other assets with the, with, with the rest of the world. Remember, what you're seeing and hearing now in the United States is the rhetoric of people who fundamentally 
have an ax to grind about the way the world is changing. And the world is changing so that people who look like us in this room are literally beginning to have a leveler, a more level playing field than we've ever had before. And even though we're not where we need to be or would want to be educationally, we are a heck of a lot further away than where we were. And we are not as dependent upon, quote unquote, the motherland as we used to be. We're not as dependent upon other governments as we used to be. Yes, as I was coming into here, I was watching and listening to people describe for me what is happening, what's happened to the sugarcane industry here. It has changed overnight. The same is going to happen with the, the same is going to happen with the, uh, with oil, frankly. It's always going to come and then it's going to go. And the question will be, as was put to me in, in Dubai, what then will you have? You will have a country that is predicated on, a, on an economic strong uh, platform or you'll have a country that is completely dependent upon others for goods and services uh, and its own GDP. Our next question comes from Pro-Chancellor Singh. Dr. Kuru, thank you very much. I'm uh, Joe Singh. Thank you very much for uh, what I consider to be a brilliant articulation of uh, the subject matter. My question has to do really with what advice can you offer this university in going about establishing the demand, the demand you refer to, mm -hmm. and the competitiveness, which, mean, which in my view has to be sustained right. because of the dynamics of the marketplace. Right. Um, what in your experience has worked? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. The, fir the first thing I would say is you really have to recognize that the metaphor that we're working out of right now is unfortunately still too uh, supply side centered, which means you have to be strategic about where do you start peeling your fingers off of the supply side theory. You have to start thinking in terms of how do we flip the switch from supply side economic theory to demand side. What that means is, in my head, A, it means that you're literally going to have to start talking to the market differently than you've ever spoken to the market before. You're going to have to literally talk to young people. You're going to have to get data on those young people and what they're thinking and what they're playing with in terms of options in their mind. Why do, it's as important for me to know who didn't come here as would be who did and why they chose not to come here. Secondly, I would say that one of the things that will be incredibly important to do is to examine the warehouse, if you will, of your own product. What is it you offer? To whom do you offer it? How vibrant and useful is it to, those po to that population? What are they saying about your product? Who hires your young people? When they leave the country and they go to some other country, do you know what brought them there? What, what did that person attract them with? Is it just the promise of a job, or is it more money, or is it, or is it something else? What is it that they are offering in the demand side world that we're not offering? And the last part of this is, I think you really do have to have much more, um, I, I talked about this very quickly, but um, the, the, they're, 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 the, the, the market we're in now, it seems to me is much more driven by instinct than by science, right? So I don't know that anybody needs a new stepped up version of the iPhone, but if it came out, they'd have a line around the store trying to figure out how to get it, right? It isn't because we all need it, but we've created this demand for it by virtue of how we have engaged in the market with our stuff, with our product. This evening, this evening's event, this kind of a group, this kind of a discussion, this kind of an intellectual kind of pushing back and forth is the natural equivalent of the changing of a tide. It is the environmental equivalent of a changing tide. You need to do more of this. 
we ought not fear the crisis that grows out of this. We ought to actually lean into that crisis and use the energy of that crisis to move the agenda forward. Part of institutions that I struggle with and have all my career, is part, part of the institutional lethargy is a function of never being able to overcome the inertia of what is in preference for what could be. So we never get our nose over the, over the bow of the boat. We're always just bobbing in the boat and being, if you will, sort of tied to the, to the wave action as though we have no alternative. And I'm saying, no, there is an alternative, but we have to lead in that direction. You have to turn this over to young people. This movement that's happening in the states regarding the unfortunate tragedy that happened at Parkland is in a good example of young people overcoming the inertia. Well, the same is true for the leadership of a college or a university here or in my college as, as well. You've got to be willing to do that, and that means relinquishing, relinquishing some of, the, some of the, uh, the essence of what we think is power and literally allowing other people to harness it to their backs, to their intellect, to their ideas, and now allowing them to push forward. You and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't know you well, but, but I'm going to assume that we're somewhere in the same age cohort. Our, our time is now, is, is now it, it, we can look back on it and be reflective about it. But the young people who are coming into your college, they own the future. And you have to let them play uh, as though they do own it. Thank you. We have a question at the back. And please introduce yourself. Good evening, I'm Dr. Don Fox from the Department of Chemistry. Thank you, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. My question is about the personal adequacy that you refer to. Yes. From your experience, what are some practical initiatives that we can do while the students are with us on campus to build that resilience? Really interested in that. Uh, thank you. So this is an area that I've been interested in um, actually since I was a teacher many, many years ago. Um, I had students who I thought of as being um, intellectual geniuses, but they were socially ho horribly inadequate. Uh, and they got thrown out of school all too often. They got uh, discouraged from continuing in school. Um, they just simply were, they were buffoons from time to time. And I loved them dearly, but they acted like buffoons. And so I began to focus on what is it that we can do in schooling to reward behaviors that are more modeled after being a collaborative, engaged learner, right? What are the things? Well, one of those things is you can change the structure of how students engage. So the the day-to-day the, the -day environment at Medgar has all kinds of classes and to and fro, the same way as it does, does here at this university. But what I began to do was to actually talk with students about this business of how do you have social contact in a meaningful way, even if it's momentary. So I now, in the hallways, I speak to young people and I make them stop. I don't care where you're going, but I make them stop to look me in the eye and say good morning or good evening or good afternoon, Dr. Crew. And I want you to not have your hat on. And I want you to literally look me in the eye and talk to me for two seconds. Don't I don't want to hear that, right? What I'm saying is the demand that we place as adults, as significant caring adults, the demand we place on these young people is the demand for their rising of their standard of what it means to be a human being. So I want them to go to school and understand that not everybody will pray to the same God. Not everybody is going to wear the same garb. Not everybody is going to ultimately know their language or your language. But you have a responsibility in this college, on this block, at this time, with you being here, you have a responsibility to raise to a level of your A game what it means to be a human being in this college. Now, that means that the adults have to model that. It doesn't mean that you can just lay this demand out on students and that's where it stops. It means that you literally have to create a culture, an environmental culture, in which the way we do business is we do business with human beings who have intellects and they have hearts and they have minds that are, and they have their own free will. And so you talk to them in that way, 
you regard them by, that, by, the, by those standards, and then you hold them to that standard. The thing that I've not figured out how to do, uh, when I was a high school principal I had done this, but, but I don't know how to do it in, in, in tertiary education yet, is to actually grade in some meaningful way what does that really look like for a student. So you get a grade in a class in, 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 uh, in, in African American studies or, so, or something, you get a grade that reflects your intellectual engagement in the course. I want you to actually have some way of getting feedback about how you were as a person in the course. I want you to actually know that the, the, the world we seek is not necessarily a world in which you are simply technically prepared, but in which you have empathy to live in that world. It's a very different standard. Martin Luther King's work really didn't say you needed to be just brilliant. It said you needed to be a good, a person of goodwill and good heart. And we don't really talk about that very much. We don't necessarily even reward it very much. Uh, students who are coming to this college every day from some of the most ungodly, impoverished communities and worlds unknown to many of us. And they come every day God sends and they show up and they try their best and they've been homeless for six months or a year or whatever it may be, and they're so happy to be in class, and yet, by goodness, won't be two minutes before someone will say, well, you didn't do the homework, so you're now, you didn't do the class assignment, and so now you can't participate, and so, and it blows their, it blows their mind. It blows their mind, because their whole sense of adequacy has now been destroyed, right? I already don't have money. I didn't, my, my tuition bill is not paid. I, I didn't do very well on the test. Please let me at least be a human being. So I think that you've got to create a culture where you talk about this, you talk about it with faculty, you recognize that the unit of change in this institution, and frankly in every institution I've ever been in, the unit of change is the relationship that a, a, a caring adult has with a young person. That's what changes. When that changes, people become extraordinarily powerful. And I would simply say continue to have that debate Talk to people about it, move in that circle, model it for people, ask them to model it, find out why they're afraid not to, et cetera, et cetera. Next question. Yes, I said. My, my mind is not a, I've logged repeat by chance. My mind is not a question, it's, it's really two comments, Rudy. Really. And the first of which connects to your last set of comments. If one were to literally take the notion of bridging developed and developing countries without necessarily having, as some of us have had the benefit of operating in both environments, you would get a notion of exclusivity of constituency developed versus developing. But one of the realities, and it's not a reality only in New York, it's a reality in many other parts of the United States. There are equivalencies of developing countries in the educational arena and the economic arena. The reference you made recently, uh, just now, Rudy, to homeless students and that kind of context. I had the privilege, as you know, of serving for six years at your college, sister uni college of yours. There were students who did not have any place to study. We would run around final exams for two weeks before, two weeks after, 24 hours in the, li in the, in the library, places because you coming in a home environment where sometimes as a first generation student in college, there was not a lot of empathy or sympathy for what you were experiencing. Why did you, why did you can't go the extra 10 hours to work and to pay your way? So my first point is really to enable us not to literally take the divide, but there are elements of developed in the developing and the elements of the developing in the developed. I've had the fortune of living and working in Georgia, in New York, in Virginia, and in Florida. 
And in each of those states and others that I've visited, you had that dichotomy, you had that reality, that duality. My second point is this. I think I, I like very much your adequacies, personal, work, civic. But I want to recommend that, not that you are not aware of it, Rudy, but I think it's important that as a conversation audience, we keep in mind that although the educational entity is high schools, middle schools, universities and colleges, although we have a responsibility for enabling students to have those adequacies, we are not the only ones with those responsibilities. And sometimes the difficulty of enabling the educational institution to do adequate preparation for those adequacies rubs up against some of those other entities whose actions are competing and competing in ways that are not helpful. So the question you may be asking, what's your name again? I'll pick on you since uh, Rudy pick on you. Cleon. The question Ian is, Cleon is asking is, what are some of those other entities that bear responsibility for some of those preparations for the adequacies, some of which may sometimes rub against what the colleges and universities and high schools are doing? One of those is the very fundamental institution called the family. The family. And it is the breakdown of many families that allows those personal adequacies to not be there. Those civic adequacies not to be there. So part of what is the responsibility of a university, particularly, where a developed country, developing country, is how might in enabling the adequacies to be prepared, how might you have to help those families that are in crisis? How might you have to help those families where, you know, in 1957, very distinguished anthropologist wrote a book called My Mother Who Fathered Me, Edith Clark. And what Edith Clark was talking about was the anthropological reality of Jamaica, those four communities in Jamaica that she studied, that are true of every part of the United States and of the Caribbean. And it has grown to be a more significant reality of not only mothers who are fathering, but young mothers who are not even adults having to raise, sometimes not one, but two kids. No longer is the extended family there in a support structure to help. So sometimes part of what makes the job of the college, the university, even more stressful is that mechanism called the family, where, to use your term, the dysfunctionality exists, where the families themselves needed to be, need to be asking, how might you, high school, how might you, University, help me be a better parent, mother, father. So I think the family, we cannot discount the importance of the responsibility being shared with the family. But here's another institution. Particularly for societies like Guyana, where we at least platitudinously talk of ourselves as being religious. And in many parts of the United States, we're platitudinously religious. The religious institutions bear significant responsibility to help with those personal adequacies, those civic adequacies. The messaging and the conduct and the interpretation of whatever the holy book is, Bhagavad Gita, Quran, Bible, the interpretation and the messaging regarding your holy books and your practices can either help or hurt those adequacies civic adequacies, work adequacies. So I think we bear, we, we owe it to ourselves to be having candid conversations about the religious institutions that have also responsibility to help. Not only prepare the soul for the afterlife, 
But how do you, while you're on earth, ensure that you help to have a better family in your village if you are church or if you are temple or if you're mosque? How might you not only praise and shout the Lord on Sundays and then Monday you go back to beating your wife and neglecting your kid? How might you enable your institution to benefit your institution being a religious institution to benefit from conscious effort in the part of education institutions to make the contributions that you platitudinously offer to be practiced in real life. And I would offer the third, a cluster of institutions and they are a manifestation of some of the technological changes that you spoke about that have a responsibility to help in the preparation of the various adequacies. And sometimes the manifestations of their work undermine those adequacies. Those, that media is, that institution is the media. What we say on social media <laughs> help or can hurt personal adequacy, civic adequacy. The license that come with the freedom of speech with the mediation of technology, sometimes goes against what you're trying to instill values-wise in the university, values-wise in the family. And so we've got the responsibility now to work with those other entities, media. How might we help them? It's okay to say that I've got free speech, but there is something also to be said for having accurate speech. It's okay to say, well, I can use a technology, but it is not appropriate for you to be going slandering, libeling, just because you've got this technology and you can jump on it and say what you want, not realizing how you are undermining personal adequacy of your own. We had an unfortunate case, which I've seen, I'm sure you will have seen too, Rudy, in, in back in the States, happened about a year and a half right here in Guyana. This young man committed suicide because someone took a picture, private picture of his kissing his friend, assumed that he was gay, posted it all over Facebook. The guy felt so embarrassed, committed suicide. That is a case for me of a reality of the license of the technology and the speech freedom helping to undermine the values, the adequacies. So I wanted to put a footnote that yes, we have the responsibility as education institutions, but we also have a shared responsibility with other entities in our societies, whether developed or developing. Because families, religious institutions, and media also have multiple stakeholder opportunities, some of which are not exercised in the best interest of those very adequacies. There's a point to that, and there's a point that the uh, person who uh, spoke, uh, you're in the law, law school. So one of the things that, uh, and I like your list of courses that you would add one of the things that I've been hungry for, and you know, don't send this back to the college just yet, but it, it's, it, it's in my mind, is this question of moral reasoning and a way by which it's not just logic, it's the reasoning that is anchored to a set of moral principles. I think the technology snafus that we've had in today's world derive not from the technology themselves, but from the way that that technology is unfortunately being harnessed uh, by, by individuals who have lost their moral footprint, if you will. And I worry about that as it relates to uh, generations of young people who are without, as you say, some of those supportive environments where adults help them to know where the borders are of ego and um, and technology, and they don't know those borders, and they are literally trafficking in 
the, the, the worst kind of um, sort of heinous, journalistic, nasty, vile kinds of uh, uses of the technology, some of which you just alluded to, but it stems from, in their mind, when you talk with them about this, when you ask people about this, what you get is this blank piece of the conversation in which you recognize they don't have any moral moorings. They're not developed morally. They're developed physically, and they're developed intellectually, and they can tell you all about the various aspects of the technology, but their moral reasoning powers are really, really, really lacking. Uh, and so I would simply argue that the list of things that you were talking about, re rhetoric and, and so forth, uh, being a part of that, I would love for us to have much more conversation. Um, and, and, and yes, I, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Griffith, that the, that, the, that the parents and all these other institutions do play a part. You're exactly right about that, which means, but the way I look at that is that's just another market for us. We ought to be in that market helping those parents to come back to school or to learn something that they can learn as a way of being able to do their parenting and you know, charge tuition at a half the rate or whatever you want to do. But we have something in our college called Parent Academy, which is just our way of teaching parents how to be parents. Right? And they were 15 or 18 or 19 or 20 when they first had their first child, and they don't know. They just simply don't know. There's a generation of this. In any case, the, the idea here is that we've got to find ways by which to start creating um, a national conversation um, that strikes up the ban for uh, people, people essentially being able to, to look at circumstances, look at the same movie and come away with the same conclusion. When you see people being shot by an AR-15 and you don't need it to hunt and you don't need it for any protection, Reasoning without religion would even tell you that that's not something you want to have prevalent in your society. But what happens is this gets twisted in the political world, and that political world then begins to try to turn what essentially is logic around human beings and human development and human need. It turns that into, well, you know, this is a First Amendment right or a Second Amendment right, and so on. It's none of that. It's none of that. Long before it was that, it was just simply a kid with a gun. Long before it became any of that, it was simply a kid with a gun who wanted to prove that he or she was as grown as the person who, who, who made them angry two days ago. And I'm saying to you, schooling and moral reasoning and the ability to step into this space where young people are trying to figure out hard questions about who they are and where their lives are going and how to get there. I'm saying that, that, that colleges and universities like elementary, middle, and high schools have to step into that space and start trying to answer that question with them. Not for them, but with them. We'll have one final question in the corner there. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, I have articulated the view that education institutions should be learning communities and that the learning process should commence from the entrance and conclude at the entrance. Given what's being discussed and the deficiencies we have in family, church, and other places, should we not do away with the idea of extracurricular activities and make everything in the university a curricular activity so that we can, by virtue of that, indicate the all-inclusive nature of education rather than academic and other. Thank you. T tell me your name so I can make sure I puncture your tires of your car when I go out. <laughs> um, I actually like the idea, I hadn't thought about it to be perfectly honest with you, but I, I rather like the idea of a ubiquitous educational or learning environment in which the experience is holistic. It, it's, it's on multiple levels. Um, 
it, it, it forces a kind of an equal treatment of the arts program or the athletic program with the English department or the science department. Um, I, I've oftentimes believed, and the reason I'm, I'm thinking this through as I'm answering you, but I've often believed that the short of reading and writing and math, there's not one subject matter that I would say everybody's got to know to be able to be successful in the, in, the, in the world. Short of reading, writing, and math. You do have to know how to decode. You do, know have, to ha you do know how, have to know how to do mathematics. And you do know how to have literal comprehension of what you read. But short of that, other disciplines, even though I'm a former English teacher and so forth, th there's not something that I would say automatically we have to, everybody universally has to know. I'm sure that would come as different for different people given their own disciplines. But, but I do think that there are very important skill sets, different from knowledge base, but there are very important skill sets that happen and get used and applied when you are playing cricket or when you are playing basketball or when you are an artist or when you are trying to understand why an artist drew a certain picture, or how and why did Monet use uh, water lilies as a medium for being able to explain his world view. I think that there are skills that have to do, and I call them with human interaction skills, in which the curriculum should serve that. See, I never bought very hard. The US did this thing with, you know, with standards, and all schools will have to have students operating a certain standard. Even when I was superintendent, I didn't buy that notion very much um, because I don't necessarily, it's not that I disagree with standards, it's just I don't think they're the right standards. It wasn't about you have to be able to read or write at a certain level. Yes, you do need to be able to, but it's not about that. It's not what schooling is for. Schooling is about the transfer of knowledge and skill and values person to person to be able to fuel the democracy. And if you don't have a mechanism for being able to do that, other than the casualness by which we regard these extracurricular activities, right? you create this differentiation. Extracurricular is different from regular core curricular. And that's even more different yet from uh, students who are in vocational programming. So we've created this kind of nomenclature that is a little bit strange in my mind. The idea is you need to learn how to learn. And you need to learn how to apply that learning to any circumstance, whether you're going to be on a farm or you're going to be in a business office. And you need to have a sense of, I go back to this conversation about moral reasoning, and you need to understand why things are as they are or why you are doing at least what you're doing. And I'm simply saying that it's strange to me that as we think about a world that has gone, in many cases, all crazy, we have almost lost our way, that we aren't now simultaneously asking young people as they're practicing this thing called schooling, I, I, want, you to, I want you to hear that there is a raison d'etre, there is a reason for you to be where you are, and you can't ever look back and say, I did this on my own. There are no islands unto themselves. You have to learn that you, have, you, are, you are a child of God. You've been placed on here by the grace of God, and you owe back. You have to pay back. And the, and the, and the ability for you to pay back is that you're going to do this for someone else. And there's a requirement for you to do that. What I see these young people in the U.S. now doing is trying to pay that back. They're trying to include, for example, Black Lives Matter because they know Black Lives Matter started this whole movement. They're trying to basically say, you didn't get your props because in the world view, you don't have any kind of prestige enough to be able to get your props. But we do because we're wealthy people from Florida, from a well community, a well healed community in Florida, and we'll allow you to come forward and join us. We want you to join us so that you now can get this point out to the rest of the world. That's moral reasoning in its highest form for young people, to me. So I'm simply saying that it, I, I, I like the idea of you doing that. I'm a, I'm a little afraid that the architecture of that would cause you to lose your car before I would, I would find you. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
the architecture of that would play absolute hell in the academy. So I don't know exactly how to, how to do that. But I do think you're, you're right in sentiment that there is this need for a kind of a more egalitarian look at the intellectual diet uh, that, we, that we provide for young people. Thank you so much for your thoughtful uh, question. It was good. OK, folks, thanks for a wonderful evening. As we move to the end of our evening, I have four things I'd like to do. First of all, on behalf of the university, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor Reynolds and her team, and everyone here, I'd like to say, Dr. Crew, thank you very, very much for a very good time. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to ask if the Vice Chancellor, along with Pro Chancellor Singh and don't get up yet, don't get up yet. <laughs> and Justice Singh would be kind enough to use their good offices to keep Dr. Crew here a little longer. <laughs> this conversation has been so rich that it is one that needs to be repeated over and over again throughout the 10 regions. And I can say to you again, Dr. Crew, thank you very much. Thirdly, I'd like to Thirdly, I'd like to remind everyone of some very important dates on the back of your program, starting with tomorrow evening, when we've got our Turkan and Tain Talks 12 on a very important subject that's related to our conversation this evening, race, reality, and reconciliation in Guyana. That will be held at the Pegasus, and it's at 6 o'clock tomorrow evening. And then next Wednesday, we've got our Law and Society 3, we have the Honorable Car Justice Carl Singh who will be delivering it on the constitutional guarantee of fundamental rights and the citizen. Sometime in eight this month, we've also got the race for pace, and I'm told the Vice Chancellor has already decided that everybody's wheel is going to get damaged so he can win the race again. <laughs> and then we've got the Entrepreneurship Conference, which will be held on May 20th through the 22nd under the theme economic transformation through entrepreneurship and innovation. Finally, I'd like to ask Ms. Monique Pedro to come forward and provide us with the appreciation. institution in the developing country that does not have resources. <laughs> I couldn't offer you the $10,000 you get from the appreciation mortgage, but I wanted to offer you a small token of our collective appreciation, and I'll tell you what it means. The University of Guyana expresses its utmost appreciation to Dr. Rudolph S. Crew for his contributions to the University Renaissance Chancellor's Renaissance Lecture, bridging the divide in tertiary education between developing and developed countries, Turkan Guyana, April 4, 2016. I have not $10,000 here. <laughs> in my heart, it's worth more. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good it, is the, it is my privilege this evening to thank Dr. Crew for his insightful, relevant, intriguing. Can the technician adjust the mic appropriately? Good evening, everyone. It's my privilege. It is my privilege this evening to thank Dr. Crew for his insightful, 
relevant, intriguing, and humanistic lecture entitled Bridging the Divide Between Developing and Developed Countries. Many of your ideas resonate with me since I am a secondary school teacher as well as a student here at the university, so I can see it from both sides. Also, noteworthy in your speech was the notion of tertiary education in creating a level playing field for those from disadvantaged as well as privileged backgrounds. This can be done by making education as individualized yet collective, innovative yet standardized, and that ultimately caters for the demands of our society, which is one that is getting to that stage of globalization. Dr. Cruz's 30-year career as an educator, which has undoubtedly, which comes undoubtedly, sorry, with his expertise and experience in education has indeed been, been of benefit to all of us who are here this evening. We are also thankful for the Renaissance Lecture Series, which is an initiative by our very own Vice Chancellor, Professor Ivlaw Lloyd Griffith, holder of the Cassie Crown of Honor. These lectures are intended to facilitate discussions about strengthening the core pillars of academic enhancement, capital investment, economic viability, and alumni engagement. And from your questions that were asked this afternoon, as well as the responses that you give, it was proof that this indeed served its purpose. Engage national and international higher education policy leaders and practitioners with a view to strengthening the University of Guyana international engagement. And thirdly, enhance the educational entrepreneurship of the University of Guyana and its constituent units. We're all very grateful for this initiative, Dr. Griffith. We would also like to thank Professor Leland Lucas, Ms. Camille Robertson, Mr. Winslow Patterson, Ms. Lucian Blake, Ms. Fiona Sanko, all of whom have made their own individual contributions to the success of this evening's proceedings. Special thanks to these other contributors, the Chetty Jagan International Airport, Learning Resource Center, Public Relations Office, Maintenance Division, Registry and Deputy Vice Chancellor Reynolds, and the Planning and International Relations theme. Finally, thanks to all in the audience who have made the time to be here this evening and who have stayed until the end of the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pedro. Colleagues and friends, this brings to the end the events for this evening. We now invite you to join us for light refreshments, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening at the Pegasus Hotel. Thank you. Thank you.